Hello, in this lecture we will discuss methods and algorithms and equipment that we use for the examination and resuscitation of acute patients. So, uh, where do we speak about the acute care and uh, in these situations? Uh, this is uh, some aspects described in every medical show or movie when the patient is admitted in some kind of uh, urgent condition. Uh, he requires emergency care first, where we uh, just call out uh, different specialists. We summon a like, trauma team or some kind of the fast response team, uh, which is uh, responsible for the uh, at the same time for examination of the patient and for the stabilization of condition, and uh, then after this emergency care, they decide on what's next. Uh, what's next? Uh, which treatment will patient uh, uh, be needing in the near future? So uh, these conditions are uh, general areas uh, which include the pre-hospital care, like on the ambulances, on the field hospitals, in the triage rooms in hospitals, in the emergency departments in hospitals. We don't have that much in Russia, but they are common. And in uh, most of countries uh, where they use uh, like British or American uh, healthcare model, uh, you will see emergency departments everywhere in um, America. They are called emergency rooms or the ER. Uh, like we have the uh, iconic uh, medical show uh, from 1994. And uh, in the British uh, uh, healthcare and British alike healthcare, they are called A and E, uh, which stands for accidents and emergency. Uh, still, the idea is the same. Uh, this, uh, they are rooms uh, just like we do have in our intensive care units, but they are close to the hospital entrances and acute patients, they come directly into these rooms. Uh, what equipment do they have? They uh, have respiratory support, uh, they have uh, all the um, um, tools and maneuvers available, which we have discussed in the airway management video. Uh, there are equipment uh, for the resuscitation, for CPR, uh, then there must be an urgent lab available, uh, which can provide at least some uh, lab tests for 24-7. Uh, also, the radiology mu must be available for emergency x-rays, emergency CT, and so on, like the angiography, if we are talking about the center responsible for treatment of uh, myocardial infarction or stroke center. Uh, so, you get the idea. Uh, they do have access to all the modern and needed uh, researches 24-7, and uh, they can do that uh, without uh, any delay. Uh, so, when the patient is admitted, even before the patient is admitted, the ambulance have to notify the facility that the patient uh, in acute condition is coming, uh, so that the hospital will uh, team up the response team, uh, will prepare all the equipment, and uh, as soon as the patient is inside, they will start. So, uh, we are discussing the uh, algorithm called the ABCDE. Uh, this is really um, much uh, commonly used uh, in the whole world uh, system for, uh, at the same time, simultaneous resuscitation, examination and planning for treatment in acute patients. Uh, it's called the ABCD. Um, the abbreviation is for systems that are being examined. Uh, how do they uh, came up, how did they come up uh, with the ABCD uh, exactly? Um, there is a there was a statistic, big statistic research uh, on the causes of death in acute patient, and they have um, uh, all the causes listed on the probability. And uh, for example, they say that the most likely cause, uh, the most the thing that kills the fastest uh, is their problems with the airway, like the airway obstruction. That's why they place the examination of the airway first. Uh, this is the A from the ABCD, so uh, A is the airway. Uh, then the patient is uh, highly likely to die due to a respiratory problem. That's why they selected B, breathing, to be the, third, uh, the second thing. Then the circulation problems and then all the others. And uh, they just formed uh, all our manipulations into the algorithm so that we will treat first what kills first. And uh, that's how the whole system was invented. Why do we even need the ABCD? Uh, nobody is doubting the uh, quality of work in the emergency departments, but uh, they say that, um, not they say, no, it's not like gossip, it's a scientific fact that uh, in case of emergency scenario, uh, the room gets uh, chaotic and some key, um, some vital points uh, in patient care may be missed. And in this case, of course, this will 
result in the poor uh, diagnostics and the poor treatment, some cases uh, that may lead to the patient death or severe complications. That's why uh, they've also came up with a uh, systematic approach so that everyone in the room uh, will know uh, what should uh, come next, what should be happening in every second. In some departments they have regular training so that everyone must know his role and must know his responsibilities in case of any accident. And that's really great because uh, also in case of emergency you do not waste additional time on tactical planning. Um, that's because you have all the basic scenarios of behavior in your staff and everybody knows uh, what to do. They do some basic stuff, they get some basic data and only then you just stop to uh, just make a adjustments uh, to do some planning and some analyzing. Uh, as soon as you are uh, sure that the patient is kind of stabilized and you get some uh, basic diagnostic data. So uh, now I believe we should list uh, the equipment. Uh, the equipment uh, may be uh, diagnostic, like the basic tools, like the a stethoscope, like the blood pressure cuff, like the monitoring devices. Uh, also, um, uh, the diagnostic tool may um, can, uh, include the ultrasound machines, like the portable ultrasounds. Uh, most uh, hospitals, most, most countries uh, which use the acute care system, uh, they uh, train the emergency doctors uh, or the ICU doctors to use their uh, ultrasound uh, by themselves, so you do not uh, get patients to some kind of some kind of office of the uh, sonography doctor, but you do the basic uh, examination by yourself. Um, more on that later, actually. And uh, now let's look at the ABCD itself. Uh, I will do everything step by step and I will comment uh, while I'm doing that. Of course, in real life, as I've said, this is the work of a team. Uh, they work really fast. So right now this will be much slower than it should be in real life. But still, for educational purposes, this is how we're going to do that. So, we have our crash cart available, we are in some kind of hospital setting with the emergency department ready, and we do have a patient admitted. Uh, he, let's say, the diagnosis is not important now, so let's just get the patient. Uh, so, we look at medical data, maybe, before uh, we uh, start to contact the patient. I must say, hello, can you hear me, what's happening? and uh, maybe get some response from the patient. If we do uh, get the response that's all right, then we can talk to patient, at least try to talk. We can get complaints, chief complaints, we can get a medical history, uh, there may be some kind of uh, co-diseases, uh, medical, allergy, uh, medical allergies, um, then last oral intake, so how long ago did the patient eat something? This may be important for the uh, following surgery if there's this kind of surgical pathology. So we can talk to the patient. Let's say for now that patient is not responsive, but we definitely see that he is alive. So we don't have to check the life signs. We don't have to start the CPR. We know we are sure that patient is alive, but we're trying to wake him up and he is unresponsive. Then we say, okay, if nobody is knowing, then we have to call for help now. We have to provide the crash card. Uh, right now, let's say that everybody knows, but just nobody is going to help me. Now, for the further work with the patients, we have to take care of the uh, PPE, the personal protection. Um, it's ideal if we uh, do that before the patient's arrival, um, so that we do not waste time right now. We must use gloves, we must use maybe vests or some kind of cover um, above our clothes. We must use face masks, hats, and uh, ideally the face shields or glasses to provide us from any droplets that may come from the patient that may be infectious. Right now, let's just give the suggestion of the PPE by using the gloves. So, uh, we now proceed to letter A. Letter A is the airway. And to do uh, that, to check the airway, we have to just manually look at this, maybe ask the patient to open the mouth if the uh, patient is following the command. Or we can open the mouth manually and see uh, if there is kind of visual problem there. So, for example, the teeth are missing, there is bleeding, there are vomiting masses, so on. If we see something, then we must do something right now, so we, um, we can use the aspiration machine, or we can use surgery tools to remove some kind of solid objects. Uh, so we somehow 
look uh, and uh, make sure that at least visual uh, part, um, uh, visible part, sorry, at least visible part of the airway is clear. Then, if the patient is in coma condition uh, or he's going to cardiac arrest or so on, then we have to suggest about the airway protection. Right now, I am alone, that's why I will not go into intubate the patient, but also to give a suggestion, we are going to insert the oropharyngeal tube inside the patient to just make sure that the tongue will not slip and uh, he will still be there. Also, uh, the oropharyngeal tube, uh, as you may imagine, causes the vomiting reflex. So if I am able to position the tube uh, correctly, quietly, without any response to the patient, this is also an indication that something serious is going on. So the patient's reflexes are decreased and he is not responding to the tube. So the tube is inside. Now uh, we proceed to the monitoring of the function of breathing. Uh, we can do that by using the pulse oximeter. Uh, this may be a separate device. Right now we imagine the situation where we do not use the pulse oximeter separately, but we use the cardiac monitor. You see that it has plenty of wires. Uh, we will look at them separately one by one. Uh, you see that's really a real life situation where everything is mixed up absolutely badly and of course it must not be that way but it usually is uh, so we have to get them separated from each other sorry for that and we apply the pulse oximeter on the finger of the patient and we get the pulse rate uh, on the screen and we get the uh, oxygenation in percents. Uh, the normal um, saturation level is 95 to 100 percent, usually 95-99. Um, right now it's a mannequin so uh, we can imagine that probably it has some respiratory insufficiency and if he does we uh, have to use something for the uh, oxy oxygen therapy. Uh, right now, we also imagine that patient is breathing. We can check that. Uh, and if the patient is breathing, that means that we do not have to use artificial ventilation. Uh, so we use normal oxygen mask, put them on the face of the patient uh, with the oropharyngeal tube and with the natural breathing of the patient. This will be all right. So the patient is breathing now, his saturation level will increase uh, sometime, uh, so we proceed to another part. Now uh, we're clear with the letter A and we're going to letter B, uh, which is for breathing. To evaluate the breathing we have to remove all the clothes from the chest of the patient. Right now we did that. Uh, we have to do several tests. Firstly, we have to check the, uh, the respiratory rate of the patient. To do that, we can place our hand on the chest or we can just look at the chest and count how uh, often does it rise to get the respiratory rate. So uh, we do that. Then we have to make a chest percussion uh, just to compare just to compare sounds and see if all lungs are present normally. There is no collapsed lung, uh, no uh, masses like blood masses inside, so we should get the equal results. Then we do the chest auscultation. We do that on the anterior side, uh, on lateral sides also, and ideally on the back side too. But in case of emergency care, you can exclude the back's, uh, back auscultation for now and just stay with the uh, anterior and lateral walls and leave it to some, some later point. Uh, also, in some cases, if we're talking about trauma patients, we, use uh, we look visually, maybe do some compressions from the sides and from the front to see if there is some movement of the ribs so maybe there are some signs of uh, rib fractures and we of course see uh, how two sides of the chest are uh, rising together if there is uh, one um, half of the chest delaying so the, um, there is a delay or there may be no even uh, no uh, respiration here on one side so we can suggest the pneumothorax the hematorax or uh, more specifically, the attention pneumothorax, which is a life-threatening disease that we treat right now. If we detect it, we have to do the needle decompression. To do that, we look 
at the clavicles, which is this bone. We look at the middle clavicular line and we uh, just count two ribs uh, lower. And uh, this is the space where we do the needle decompression. If possible, you ride, uh, you raise the head of bed to elevate the patient so that the air will come up in this area and you will not damage the lung, it will just be compressed somewhere lower. And then you insert a needle from the peripheral IV, for example, uh, so that the air will come out the patient. Uh, but you must know the indications for tension pneumothorax and when we uh, discuss trauma and when you uh, maybe read about uh, the trauma, you will see that uh, there are strict indications and we uh, only do that for tension pneumothorax and if the pneumothorax is stable, then for now we can leave it and call the surgery and uh, the surgeons, the uh, thoracic surgeons will do that for us because they are generally more qualified than the doctor in emergency room in this particular manipulation. Also depends on the country. In some countries, emergency doctors are responsible for placing the chest tubes. So this is uh, uh, debatable. Uh, so we have checked the breathing function. We are sure that the lungs are breathing fine. Uh, we have more on the uh, way when we do the x-rays, but not for now. And uh, now we proceed to letter C. C is for circulation. So after we checked the airway and the respiratory function, we uh, come to heart and blood vessels. Uh, we do number of manipulations here. Firstly, we can look at the pulse rate on the monitor if it's available, uh, but we have to check the pulse, uh, the bilateral pulse on the arms. Uh, we check if it's present. If it's not present on the arms, that means the patient in severe shock, so you look for a uh, hugely decreased blood pressure. So the pulse must be present, must be symmetrical, must be of a good strength. So this is also a sign of good blood pressure. Uh, then as soon as you are sure that um, you have pulse on both uh, hands, you can count the pulse on one hand uh, or you can rely on the monitor. But we suggest that you uh, just at least one do the test yourself. So you make sure that the monitor is showing the correct thing. Then um, we can uh, check for pulse deficiency if, uh, for example, we're talking about the rhythm disorders when we place one hand on the uh, hand to check the uh, arterial pulse and another hand um, is on the heart so that we, um, at, at the same time, we feel the heartbeat and we feel the pulse on the arm and we must see that every heartbeat leads to the pulse wave in the arm so there is no deficiency. Then we have to listen to the heart. Uh, also, we do not get any uh, specific data and we do not make any diagnosis here strictly on this test, but this is to detect some uh, really string, uh, strong, some really problematic situations. So really a huge disorder will be uh, visible here, not visible, audible. Now, uh, we proceed to applying more monitoring on the patient. Of course, we monitor the blood pressure by applying the blood pressure cuff of the monitor, or we can do that uh, manually with the manual uh, blood pressure cuff. Also, right now, everything gets too mixed. Uh, also, we have to apply the ECG pads. Um, in our patient, we already have some stickers applied. Uh, you can use these wires uh, which are used in monitoring and also you can use the defibrillator pads which are sticky pads that are attached on the sites uh, where we do the defibrillation of the patient. Uh, so you see that they're of different colors. Uh, you look at the letters written on them. Uh, first one is the red uh, which, is, which has a little R uh, which is for the right arm. You place it here on the right shoulder then you have the yellow thing, uh, which the letter L, which is for left arm. So it goes on the left shoulder. Then, then there is a black uh, pad, which is uh, letter N with a neutral. So this is necessary for the quality of the signal. It does not get any signal itself, but still we place it on the lower right quadrant of the chest. Then we have this white pad, which is C for chest. So this is for the um, ECG leads, which are V1 to V6. So this is for the, uh, for the closer monitoring here. And then we have the green, uh, which has letter F as for foot. 
Uh, this is really um, related classic of, uh, pad for a left foot and it's applied here on the uh, left lower quadrant of the chest. So here now we have five uh, leads. Um, there are also options where we have three or four leads and they may be different in colors but the classic options are red, yellow, green and black and this is additional for the uh, V1, V6. V6. So we applied the monitoring pads. We will get some uh, signal here. We'll get the ECG if necessary. And uh, actually in any patients right now, at least in Russia, we get the normal ECG. Uh, but uh, if the condition is not related to the cardiac problems, maybe this will be enough for now. Uh, and we will do the ECG later. So at least we have to, uh, to do the cardiac monitoring. And, uh, and now we have all the basic information we need about the patient's vitals. So we have the uh, pulse rate, respiratory rate, uh, blood pressure, the ECG leads, the oxygen saturation. Uh, this is already good enough and this will help us to exclude some of the conditions, but we are not finished. Also in letter C, in the circulation, we insert peripheral IVs. Uh, we do not do central lines generally in case of emergency care because it just takes too much time. But if peripheral veins are uh, unavailable for some reasons or they are too difficult to do the IV access, we can also uh, speak about central lines. Uh, right now they say that uh, also in case of critical care, uh, central line gets uh, too many contraindications and complications and uh, you have to Think about intraosseal uh, or IO access when you insert the needle inside the bone of the patient. Now, uh, as soon as we get the IV going, uh, we are not going to look at this manipulation right now. So this will be a topic of additional uh, additional video if needed. Uh, and uh, as soon as we get the IV inside, uh, now we can collect blood. Uh, for blood tests and we can start the infusion we can start the medication um, the, uh, the via the IV line uh, but firstly we uh, primarily we get the blood samples uh, when they are not mixed with the medication and only then we start the infusion therapy so we got the blood um, then also in the letter C we check the uh, circulation we check the capillary refill rate this is the test where we press on the skin of the patient then we remove our finger and we see uh, how fast the color uh, the skin color uh, goes back to normal like uh, i cannot show that on the mannequin for obvious reasons i can show that on myself so if i press it uh, there is a white spot on my skin and uh, as soon as i remove my finger you see that in two and even less than two seconds this uh, spot dis uh, this spot disappears that means that i do have enough blood volume and uh, i'm not in shock which i am aware aware of but still um, but uh, if i do not have enough blood if i had a blood loss for example of there is an anaphylactic shock and my blood vessels are dilated and my blood is somewhere doing its job so it's not stored here under the skin. You know that in Caucasian people and white people, the skin color is uh, greatly influenced uh, in um, by the amount of blood stored there under the skin. In people of color, due to uh, elevated number of uh, their color substances, um, and, uh, the skin color is not really affected. But still, in case of shock, you will see that the skin color uh, is slightly different. So anyway, you can do that on nails, you can do that on skin, uh, maybe even on the face. Uh, that's actually up, uh, up to you. But the room must be warm enough, must be well lit so that you will see any, uh, just anything. And this is a good symptom that we do in the triage and the field care in the first state because it's free, it's simple, it's fast. Uh, of course, in case of acute care here in the hospital, uh, this is not really a necessary thing to do, uh, just because we have so much stuff going on and we already know all the vitals of the patient and we can suggest the shock um, according to the uh, numbers of blood pressure and pulse rates. You know that the shock, uh, the indicators of shock are elevated heart rate, elevated pulse and decreased blood pressure. Uh, now then, uh, as we do that, uh, the letter C is over. Now we proceed to letter D. Uh, D is for disability. 
here in disability we check pupils, we check blood sugar and we check the basic neurological signs. But we start with level, level of consciousness. Uh, you remember at the beginning we were just trying to contact the patient. Uh, we didn't really evaluate it by any kind of scale. In the uh, letter D uh, we look uh, at the consciousness level more severe. And uh, we can evaluate the patient on two scales. Uh, the more uh, complex one, but uh, the more scientifically correct is the Glasgow Coma Scale or GCS. Uh, or if um, it's not available for some reasons, we can have a more simple scale, which is called the AVPU. So the GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale, has 15 points. Uh, it has three things evaluated and uh, the uh, highest point you may get is 15. This is for clear consciousness. I believe everyone who is watching this video is in level 15. The lowest score you can get is the three points. Three points is the brain death, so the complete social death for the patient. Uh, the three points that are evaluated are the eye movement, uh, the reaction to pain and reaction to vocal uh, irritation. So uh, the just all, all the scores are not necessary f to, uh, to us uh, to list right now, but still you get the idea that every part of the patient is analyzed and given the score and if the patient is able to spontaneously open eyes, uh, to talk, to react to voice, uh, to move uh, spontaneously mm, limbs, uh, that means that he is okay and then you get the idea. Uh, also, the AVPU scale, uh, it has four uh, scores. Uh, it's more used for the pre-hospital care, uh, for paramedics, but uh, even in hospitals you have to just know the readings that you get from the ambulance uh, when they give you the uh, score on the AVPU. So A is the alert, so the patient is completely awake. Then V is a voice, so the patient is uh, unawake, so he's sleepy, uh, but uh, you can wake him up with the voice, with the vocal irritation. Then P is pain, so patient does not uh, respond to the call out, but if you pinch him somehow, some make some pain irritation, a patient will react uh, somehow. And the U is the unresponsive, so that means that uh, not um, vocal and not uh, pain irritation is uh, suitable for patient to wake up, so he is completely unresponsive in some kind of coma condition. So you do the evaluation, then you look at the pupils, you can use the flashlight to do that, or you can just open the eyes and see how they react to normal room light. Uh, we check the direct reaction. So the direct reaction is that I'm uh, flashing, using a flashlight in the right eye and I'm looking at the right eye uh, associated reaction. This is called the direct reaction. And then there is a co-reaction, uh, which means that when I'm um, uh, doing the flashlight, when I'm flashing in this eye, this eye also reacts. And uh, that's why we I have to just separate eyes from one and one from another. Then we open them. Then we see if they are reacting together, are reacting on the light. Uh, also, we detect if the pupils are of different size. Uh, so this is for the pupils. Then we do the blood sugar test. We use the. Uh, we can uh, of course we can use the normal lab uh, scan, but it takes time. And we can use the uh, glucometers to do that uh, as soon as possible to just uh, take the blood sugar now. And if we get that the blood sugar is low, uh, that means that we right away give the patient a bolus of 40% uh, uh, glucose solution. Uh, then, as for the neurological scan, uh, we do not check all the reflexes and we are not a neurology specialist and uh, we do not have to be, but we do check the basal tonus uh, of the limbs. To do that, we just take every limb separately and we try to flex it and uh, feel with our hands, feel that the muscles are contracting. You know that even if you uh, take the passively lying limp and you try to move it uh, with your hand, uh, you will still see and feel some muscular reaction. So that's, uh, that's all right. That's a sign that everything is okay. You can try on each other uh, if you do not believe it. But uh, if the patient is in coma, in cardiac arrest, in relaxed condition, or maybe after a stroke, some limbs may be responding, some limbs may not be responding. So you have to select um, a limp and you have to uh, one by one check all four limbs and see if uh, you get the correct muscular reaction on every limp. Um, 
Now you do not uh, check reflexes here, we check on the tonus. Reflexes are checked uh, during the neurology exam, which is not part of the basic ABCDE scheme. And uh, that's for letter D. Uh, now for letter E, E is for the exposure and environment. Exposure meaning we have to expose the patient, so we remove all covers completely, we remove all the clothes, uh, if necessary, we cut all the clothes or rip it apart so that patient must be completely naked so that we will not miss any uh, vital signs. Then we look everywhere. We look at the skin, we look at its color, if it's uh, wet or if it's dry, if it's hot or if it's cold. If there are signs of uh, microcirculation disorders, you will see that uh, there will be change in colors a bit. And uh, uh, maybe some additional things like uh, traces of injection, uh, for example, if patient uh, has drug uh, usage problem, uh, maybe some kind of uh, vessel disorders if patient has a varicose vein disease, uh, so on. So you check everything, you look uh, on the anterior part of the patient, then you uh, place him on the side, you look at the back, you look at the back of the legs, uh, if necessary, you do the rectal exam. For example, if the patient is present with um, gastric bleeding uh, or gastric or rectal bleeding, so you have to check uh, with your finger if there is a, uh, traces of blood on the glove. Uh, and then after you do that, you place patient back. Uh, you change gloves if necessary, of course, after the <laughs> rectal exam. Then you check if there's edema on the legs. So you do that uh, by just pressing on the symmetrical parts uh, here on the feet, then here on the ankles, and you keep pressing until uh, the uh, edema is gone, so just uh, you see if there is a level of uh, edema in the lower limbs. Uh, you do that, then you do the uh, basic palpation of the abdomen, you just simply palpate it uh, superficially and you see if there is any kind of surgical trouble and uh, this may indicate a, a call out for a surgeon. Then uh, lastly you check the temperature of the patient, of course, uh, this is only one of the type. Uh, now we uh, try to use the wireless and contactless uh, temperature scanners um, to save time and to help us with the infection. And uh, after you're done with the primary survey, primary exam, uh, you have to cover the patient. Uh, that's the uh, second part of the letter E. Uh, you remember exposure was before and environment, uh, meaning the creation of environment for the patient. So you cover him with a blanket, you warm up the room, you warm up all the IV solutions that you get inside the patient. So you make sure that the patient is warm, he is comfortable and uh, he uh, just is as, as calm as possible uh, given the circumstances of the situation. So this ends the primary ABCD survey, then you proceed to additional measures. Additional measures include the lab tests. You remember that we collected blood samples from the patient a while ago when we were on the letter C. So you have to look at the blood tests, then if uh, needed, generally it's needed, you can uh, collect the urine sample to send it to the urinalysis. Uh, to do that, sometimes you may have to place the tube to get it with the catheter, or you maybe get it from the patient if the patient is uh, able to, uh, to talk and to follow commands. And then you suggest uh, some additional instrumental general radiology uh, exams, like chest X-ray necessary for everyone, like the brain CT. Uh, if you suggest that there is some kind of head trauma, also you do the X-rays of all the extremities if necessary, if you suspect that they may be fractured and you also check all the sections of the spine if you believe that patient has uh, some risk of uh, traumatic injury of the back or on the or of the neck or the uh, pelvic parts uh, if necessary you can also do endoscopic research like the gastroscopy the colonoscopy or the bronchoscopy but uh, this is done when the patient is relatively stable and of course uh, you start treating the patient uh, what do we uh, exclude generally? So uh, I'm of course not naming all the situations right now, but still, uh, when we are talking about letter A, 
uh, on the start we exclude airway obstruction then when we speak about letter b we exclude pneumothorax hemothorax severe pneumonias uh, pleural uh, effusion for example some kind of injuries uh, to the chest then when we're talking about letter c we exclude shocks uh, including anaphylactic shocks hypovolemic shocks and so on and uh, of course we get the blood samples there uh, then, when we speak about letter D, uh, we check for some kind of diabetes complications like hypo or hyperglycemia, and also we check for stroke. Uh, then, in letter E, we check for general surgery uh, disorders and so on. Uh, also, when we check all the vitals along with the temperature, uh, we can think about septic shock. So, you believe that um, in every step we exclude a life-threatening condition. And um, that's why we do have to follow these ABCD steps. We do have to follow them fully, because you may miss some uh, critical plot twist, which will influence all the answer and all the diagnosis be wrong because you missed some of the key points like you know they do something uh, sometimes in the movies when they do not have a systematic approach like they do that and uh, house md probably a really great show but still they sometimes miss something absolutely simple absolutely uh, what if everybody would done on the first second and the whole episode they think about brain biopsy some kind of critical medications which are life threatening they search the patient house they kill patients several times but uh, if they just followed all the steps correctly, they have probably treated the patient in the first three minutes and uh, there will not be any need for a really 40 minute episode of the show. So you get the idea. Uh, and that's it, that's the ABCD uh, and after uh, and um, during all the further exams you redo the ABCD. They say that you have to do that uh, at least every five minutes uh, to just recheck the vitals, recheck the consciousness uh, to see how the patient is going. Maybe he is getting better, maybe he is deteriorating, maybe there is indication for CPR, who knows. And uh, then you suggest the diagnosis and you suggest the further actions for the patient, whether he will be admitted to the ICU, to the operation room, to the general department, or transferred to another hospital if your hospital is not capable of doing some procedures that are needed for the patient. So that's the last question that ABCD is answering. Uh, if the patient problem uh, just, are you capable of uh, treating the patient uh, or does um, his needs um, just out, out, outsmart, outrage your uh, hospital uh, capabilities. So that's it for the ABCD, that's it for the acute care in general. Of course, in some hospitals there may be uh, different things. And if you have uh, an experience in practical work, uh, we will be looking forward to uh, see your feedback and uh, maybe you will share your experience with us, how you do use this system or maybe how you don't, maybe you have something instead. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button, like this video and share it with your friends. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Goodbye.